a wonderful evening to the wonderful audience. I, Neha Dhavrani, hereby welcome you to this session of OCLF 2020. Our respected guest for today is Mr. Arun Myra. Mr. Arun Myra was a part of Tata Administrative Service for 25 years and worked at various important positions in the Tata Group till 1989. He was the CEO of Tata Industries from 1977 to 1979 in Malaysia. He was a board member of Tata Motors from 1981 to 1989. He was resident director from 1981 to 1986 and executive director in corporate office from 1987 to 89. He commercially he played a key part in the Tata Motors successfully entry into the light commercial vehicle segment. After leaving the Tata Group, he worked with Arthur D. Little in the U.S. for 10 years, where he was leader of the global strategy and organization practice and managing director of Innovation Associates. In 2000, Arun Maira returned to India and held the position of chairman of Boston Consul Consulting Group till April 2008. He serves as a member of India's planning commission from 2009 to 2014. Arun Myra is a thought leader and author of several books on organizational and societal change. He has served on the boards of several companies, civil, civil society organizations, and education institutions. Presently, he is the chairman of HelpAge International. Today, he'll talk about leading, learning, and listening with moderator Shabbir Shakir. Mr. Shakir is currently the district governor of Rotary District 3030, covering an area from Nagpur to Nashik. He completed his BE from BITS Lani. Thereafter, for fewer, few years, he served some of the very well-known organizations of Indian corporate world, like Aisha Motors Limited, Bharat Petroleum Corporation Limited, Standard Batteries Limited, and Crompton Greaves Limited before uh, starting on his own. He is into the business of printing and packaging and distribution of photography equipment. One of the things he is passionate about is blood donation, which he himself has donated 138 times till date. We are really pleased to hear both of you. Over to you. Thank you, Neha. And uh, well, it's such a pleasure to be a part of this uh, wonderful uh, Orange City Literature Festival 2020 and a matter of honor and privilege to have someone uh, of the stature of Mr. Arun Myra with us. Um, while reading about uh, Mr. Myra, uh, uh, you know, the number of positions that he's occupied, uh, the things that he's, he's done in his career spanning five decades, I think the phrase, um, he's seen it all and he's done it all, uh, fits perfectly on him. But if I were to, uh, you know, pinpoint as to what this particular gentleman is all about, uh, I would say more than anything, he is a policymaker. Uh, he is a person who can um, have a micro as well as a macro view of things, as uh, someone who could uh, uh, turn uh, dreams into reality, meaning that uh, as a policymaker, he understands um, from end to end conceptualization to execution. And uh, Mr. Myra, such a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, and on what a topic, uh, leading, learning, and listening. The topic itself is extremely intriguing and um, I wonder in a literature festival what made you choose this topic leading learning and listening Mr. Mayra. Thank you very much Shabir it's a, such a pleasure to be with the Orange City Festival this year uh, and with you particularly um, I've got to know you just a little bit in uh, the, the few uh, two days that we've had since we've been introduced to each other, but I really intend to to learn much more from you and about you. And uh, I'm already expressing my ambition, Shabir, having learned a little about you, that next year, 
at the Orange Fist, uh, City Festival, Literature Festival. I, I hope that uh, you'll have written the book, which I will share with uh, the, our listeners today that I think is in you. And maybe I'll get the opportunity to uh, moderate a discussion with you. So I, I look forward to that very much. And I'm so pleased to be here today. Why leading? Why must we discuss leadership? The world is going through enormous uh, challenges and enormous uncertainty. Uh, the COVID, of course, is something which has stirred up problems in several countries, all countries, and in almost all spheres of our life. It is not just a medical problem, which doctors can find solutions for, and they haven't yet, but hopefully, with the new vaccines coming, uh, we'll be eased with respect to our fear of, of the virus. But meanwhile, our economies have got so disrupted. Our supply systems, supply chains have got so disrupted by the solutions that the doctors gave us, which was that you better lock down, you better keep distance from each other. Uh, and thus, you know, broke up the system, the economic system, and even the own healthcare system. And it's startling that they say that in our efforts to manage uh, COVID, we have prevented people who had other ailments from getting treatments during this period. And perhaps the number of people who died prematurely with other ailments, which they need not have died from because the health system was there for them, may be larger than the number of people who died by COVID during this time. So we need a different sort of leadership which can understand complex systems in which many things must be attended to together and not just firm leaders who take one thing in hand and make sure dabba dab it gets done. So there's a question about what models of leadership we need today. We have during the COVID realized that uh, the older people are the most vulnerable to this disease, right? They die in larger numbers. Before COVID came, we were concerned that we were having too many older people in the world. People were living longer because of better health systems, economic advancement, better food. And so the societies were getting burdened with more old people in proportion to the younger people. And the older people were considered as a burden on the young people. But who's going to be earning enough and providing pensions for these older people? These younger people, should be left to manage the future, the older people are a burden. And they've become a double burden now because now their health also has to be managed. So during this time, I am, since I'm the chairman of HelpAge International, which was mentioned, which is an organization, it's not an organization, it's a network of organizations around the world that has for many years, from decades, been saying, please value older people in your societies because they are an indispensable resource, an asset. They're not a burden. There's a wisdom that older people develop through the mistakes they make yeah? and the trials and errors in their lives and never lose sight of it. Otherwise, you'll repeat the same mistakes again. So during the COVID time, as we have looked around the world to see which countries have done the best with respect to management of the whole system means least amount of people dying of COVID as well as the society least disrupted in terms of, like I said, people losing livelihoods and incomes and losing access to food and medical care. Which country has done the best? Which countries have done the best? The country that has done the very best is Vietnam. And then there are other countries that follow behind that. And the countries that have done the best are countries in which the older people have been respected as sources of wisdom, like in Vietnam, Older people's associations have been formed and encouraged by government, the government of Vietnam for the last 20 years. But they say the older people are in the community. They know the pressures and pains of the community. They live through them. And around them, you can rally the whole community. The wisdom of the older people enables the communities to discover their own wisdom together and to find solutions to complex problems. So older people can be leaders, but leaders of a different sort. They don't have the energy to run with the baton and, you know, bang things and make them happen. But there's a leadership from behind in older people. So I'm going to share the story of my own mother. 
She died when she was 97 years old, going to be 98. And from the time she was about 90, well, from the time she was in her 80s, she was living entirely by herself because my father passed away some decades ago. And she was getting older, naturally, and frailer. But yet she insisted that she would live physically by herself. And she was very healthy, actually, till the very end. And she had the statement she used to make to us, uh, her children, to say, look, I don't want to add years to my life. So you keep worrying about my physical health and putting me into the hospital and old people's home and so on. That will keep my body alive longer. But I want to add life to my years. And her description of living was constantly learning. She said she remained curious. If something new happened in her little garden outside, a new type of grass appeared, she'd wonder how that came about and what it was and promptly start looking at books of grasses and the classification of grasses and they came. A new bird that she hadn't seen before flew into the Gulmohar tree in her little garden. Where did the bird come from? What sort of bird is it? And she read constantly till the end, more books till her eyes gave up when she was in her 90s. And then she started writing. She found it easier to, to write in big letters and notebooks. But always it was curiosity, learning, learning, and curiosity. So when you learn, she said, then you live. And so therefore, I'm adding now the term learning with living, that learning is the essence of, of living. And as we learn, or as we live, we learn more. And so we bring back the wisdom to leadership that we can get from uh, learning and better learning through life. So this is what I have learned from my mother, and this is what I've learned as chairman of HelpAge International about the sort of leadership and the sources of leadership that the world needs to tap into if we wish to solve these complex problems of climate change, persistent poverty, inequality, as well as, like we said, a, a business environment which is conducive to people earning more, living better, and not just being used as you know, mere labor, producing wealth for other people. We need to transform systems. And there's a wisdom with age that you get to say, let's think of many people, let's think of the whole system, and not just for my own self and my own results. But when I joined the Tatars, as mentioned by Neha in the introduction, I was there 25 years. It was my first job. I just finished college, a master's in physics from St. Stephen's College in Delhi University, and I wanted to serve the country. In those days, uh, talking about the 1960s, every person who's done well, and most people who did well as young people, the passion was to serve the country, not to make money for yourself, yeah? not to be, become a unicorn with a billion dollars in the bank, but to serve the country. It was the spirit of our freedom movement, of the spirit of, of Gandhiji, the spirit of our leaders at that time, you know, so we wanted to be leaders of that sort, to serve others, to serve uh, the, the country. I got invited by Tatas to uh, the interview to the Tata Administrative Service, and they had a system that they would just select a certain institutions and used to be around the world, like Oxford, Cambridge, wherever young Indians went to, as well as like St. Stephen's College and a couple of colleges in India, and asked, can we just meet maybe some person the principal recommended as being in some way special. And then they would get these people and spend three days with them to see whether they had the seeds of leadership uh, in them. Hmm? And so here I go for an interview um, for a business house. And I didn't want to join business because I thought that was about making money because I wanted to serve the country. And they told the story in the interview uh, about Jayan Tata, Jamshed Ji Tata, who built a steel plant in India at a time when the British didn't want India to have its own industries. He had built before that a textile mill in Nagpur in the cotton areas because he said Indian cotton should be processed by Indian industries to add value and we can buy cloth made by us. Whereas the British were taking the cotton from Vidharva, yeah, by railway lines they had built to take them to the ports and ship it to Manchester, the cotton, then convert it in their mills into fabric and sell back to us. So we were actually producing the basic material, but they were doing the industry and getting money. They became very wealthy as a country 
uh, as we all know. And so Jamshedji Tata, they said, the Tata director said, was building a new India by enabling young people, people to learn to do things that they didn't know how to do before because they were, let's say, farmers, and learn to do them as well as people anywhere else in the world. So that's how the strength came. So why don't you, Arun Mayra, if you want to serve India, join us, Tatas. And I really got taken in by that idea. Because here was something more to learn, how to build an industry in a, in a country which didn't have the infrastructure for it, like Tatas had been doing. So I joined. I was lucky to be uh, uh, selected. And I joined Tatas. And when I joined Tatas, they gave these challenges. The way of learning in Tatas was then, for the Tata administrative service, because we were very few, and there were no management schools, we had to learn, the few of us, by observing, watching, serving the leaders of Tatas. You know, how do they take decisions? Yeah. They have dilemmas, I'm sure, and more dilemmas than business leaders like yourself might have today, because you know, there's infrastructure around you. You can get access to well-trained management students to build your organization. Those days, they didn't have all these resources, and yet they built industries, great industries. And so during the interview, uh, those three days, um, I'd done physics and did very well, top in the university, but they never asked me any questions about physics, about what I knew. They were just exploring what I was interested in. And I was interested in, well, painting and art. And so they asked me how I got interested in painting and art. And they asked me how well I thought I was doing in painting and art and how I was going about learning how to be a better painter and an artist. And like that, they asked others things that the others said they were interested in and asked them how they were learning to be better at those things that they were interested in. So at the end of the interview, the three days, I was very struck that this seemed a very unusual way of interviewing. People who go into management schools, for example, learn finance and they learn it, the techniques and the, the language very well. Because when they're interviewed by a business organization who's looking for people for their finance department, they're going to be asked, do they know finance? Yeah, because you want ready-made people to serve your finance department or ready-made marketing people for your marketing department. So the Tata people, I said, but you know, you never asked me anything about what I knew. They said, well, all that you've learned so far may not be relevant to what you have to do now. I mean, none of you that we're hiring has been a manager before, right? Has built industry before. So what's the point about asking you what you've learned before? We want to know whether you're good learners. So we were checking your ability to learn to do what you want to do. Your ability to learn to do what you want to do. And those that we sense are the best learners are the ones we are taking. Because when you join us, you are going to be learning along with us to do things that Indians have not done before. And the leadership will come from those who learn faster than others, and those who learn also to lead others in learning. So this was their description of leadership. It was associated with the ability to learn and the ability to inspire others to also learn along. And so collectively, you can do things collectively which could not be done before. So that's how I got into learning how to be a leader in Tatas. It was about learning about improving my own skills also. Learning to do things I'd never done, never done before. Sumant Mulkanko, who was the uh, builder of uh, Telco, Tata Engineering Locomotive Company, which became Tata Motors in, in the 1990s, he built the foundations of that great enterprise. And he described the factories that he was building the new factories around Pune, uh, Pimpri and Chinchwood, as learning factories. Because he said, we have to do things here in these factories that have never been done uh, in India before. We had learned how to produce a truck in Jamshedpur. The designs of the truck were developed by Daimler Benz, who came to India and instructed us in how to you know, do the making of the truck. And they were the builders, the managers of the system, of which we were, again, parts. This time, they said, we are going to have to design the factory ourselves. We are going to have to build the machines in the factory ourselves. Learn to do things you've never done before and build the truck. We'll be India-built truck, India-designed truck, and we're going to sell it and compete with the Germans in foreign markets. 
And by the 1980s, it was done. So I was part of that learning story, the development of a learning factory in which everyone was learning, and the factory as a whole has learned to do things which no other Indian factory had done before. In fact, it was one of the fastest learning experiences of any enterprise in the developing world in those days. Because here was an Indian enterprise starting with hardly any resources, any you know, infrastructure resources or even technological resources, competing then with the world's best. And during those years, same years when I was with the Tata Steers, the government of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, who you know, was the founder of Singapore, appealed to Mr. Tata that he wanted to build the most developed country in Asia outside Japan very fast, and for which they would have to inspire young people in Singapore to learn skills that they did not have, and to create in Singapore a learning institution, a training institution for young people to develop highly skilled craftsmen. And so, and he turned to GRD Tata, he said, this technology of learning is a technology that you know, and we want to import that technology. So it's set up in Singapore with us, for us, a learning factory for young Singaporeans. And I was deputed as a very young person to be part of helping the government of Singapore in that enterprise. So building in India a learning factory and helping another country with more, more resources than we had, uh, uh, learning factory too. So that's what I learned and that's what I've described in this uh, book, The Learning Factory, how the builders of Tata's, the leaders of Tata became nation builders, nation builders. So it's important that young people today get back to the technology of learning, learning to learn, learning to learn. Why? Right now for India, we say we need Atmanirbhar. We need to be self-reliant, right? Go back to what Jamshedi Tatas and Tatas had done to make us more self-reliant vis-a-vis the British. Today, we are so frightened of the Chinese. We and the Chinese were together in terms of our capability levels in industry. By the end of the 1980s, we were a little ahead maybe. Today, China is, in terms of industry, some 10 times our size. And it makes very complex products, which we are importing from China and exporting basic products back to them. So it's a relationship that we had with the British getting reversed with respect to the Chinese. Why? They have learned much faster, developed complex capabilities much faster than we have in the last 20, 30 years. So we've got to recover the ability to learn faster, to develop our capabilities faster. Now, generally also in management jargon, it is said that, oh, we are living in a VUCA age, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, yes? So whatever you're taught in management school in two years will no longer be relevant after five years because the world will have changed, new technologies will be developed. So there's no use in you know, mastering the science of finance as presently known and taught because in three years time, it will not be relevant. So what do you need to learn as a young person? You need to learn how to learn. You need to learn how to learn. That's the essence of it. Now, what is required? To, to, to learn. One is to please, you have to listen to people who know something which you don't know. And don't box yourself. Don't say, I only want to learn this one thing. Because that one thing, like we said, may not be the most important thing in the future. So keep curious. Like my mother would, you know, paying attention to varieties of of things happening around her, and she had coming to her home poor people who couldn't afford to go to school. And she would say, Okay, you're working as a child laborer, as you know, helping your mother to sweep. When you're done with that, you come home, and I'm going to tutor you. And I'm going to get you into a good school, a government school, because they can't pay, but I'm going to put you there, right? So, but listening to their stories wasn't just teaching them, she knew the lives of poor people, of young people very well. She was curious about them and how do they live and survive with so little, where we people with so much more say, oh, life was difficult for hai. How can this be? So be curious about people who are not like yourself. Listen to people not like yourself. And in India today, this has become a particular problem. Actually, it's a problem all around the world. We are living in bubbles. 
where we make friends and listen to people who think like us, people who are like us. We feel comfortable with them. The people who don't think like us, we shut them out. They are in their own circles and listening to each other. And thus, we've got, you know, divided amongst people with different ideologies, different beliefs, and so, and social media is making it even worse. Because in social media, it's designed that, you know, people who you follow and they follow you and the algorithms will keep putting you more and more in touch with such similar ideas and similar people. So we divided ourselves behind big walls, behind big walls, because we are not listening to people not like ourselves. So for leadership today, leaders must listen to many points of view so that the leader can understand the whole system. You can't have solutions which are good for only one part of the system. Like I said about medical doctors, they know the medical side of it and they're experts and they listen to other doctors and debate. And we watch these debates amongst doctors on television more and more because we have a medical problem. But what do they know about the lives of poor people and their need to find uh, jobs and, and, and medicine, even, or food? And they say, no, no, lockdown, it's very bad. People are being bad people if they venture out, but they have to venture out to live. So economists try to tell you what should be done for the economy, but are doctors listening to the economists? Are economists listening to doctors? Are all listening to the social scientists? Are rich people listening to poor people? Uh, in our country, certain communities listening to other communities? No, they're not. We're getting divided, Mr. Gore said. Yeah, narrow domestic walls. And the clear stream of reason is losing its way in the dreary desert sands of our dead habits of constantly reinforcing our own beliefs, our own beliefs. So these are the ideas that I have uh, developed and described in my book, but I've described them how I learned them in Tata's in that learning factory, including listening to the last one, where Sumut Mulgaanko would insist on me, and I was learning how to manage and become, like Neha said, resident director of one of the largest factories in India at the time, or youngest and largest factories. And he said, young fellow Myra, you're not there to teach people and order people because you don't know enough. You will walk at the factory two hours every morning, as he said, and rub your nose on the shop floor and go listen to the workers, ask them what they are doing. And the question that he would ask me, which was, what have you learned in the last week or last month? Ask every worker, kya kar rahe ho? Kyun kar rahe ho? Pichle hafte mein kya seeka hai? to improve what you're doing, encourage them to be better learners and learn from them at the same time. And this then he would ask me, every morning he would ask me what was the production like, the numbers and inventories and so on. And good managers, you have to pay attention. Then he said, okay, Myra, what have you learned in the last week? Was myself. And then say, did you meet anyone interesting? Any worker, any gardener, any manager, supervisor in your works and what did you learn from them? Like my mother, okay, same idea from Sumun Murgaankar. Be curious about other people and their lives and so on. So for leaders, uh, we must listen, especially to people not like ourselves. We must catalyze systems in which people are learning. That's what a leader's job has to be, not to instruct and teach, but to enable himself, herself to learn as well as others to learn along. So together, the system can produce results which it otherwise cannot. So be a catalyst of change, be a catalyst of leadership development of learning around yourself and do it with compassion. And that's the main thing. It's not a concern about how rich I'm becoming, how famous I'm becoming. It is because I care for others and I care for the system, which is why I said the spirit I got into after uh, finishing college, it was that spirit about I want my country to be better and the poorer people in my country to be better off compassion for them. And how can I be a better leader of systems so that the country can be a better country for everybody? Extremely uh, interesting, uh, Mr. Amara, in, in the sense that uh, uh, the thread of how you took uh, from leading to learning to listening, it's a reflection of a mindset which is extremely analytical. So what I have basically done is, um, uh, you know, I have picked out uh, certain statements um, um, uh, from uh, all that you spoke 
and what i will try to do in the next few minutes is pick on the uh, the, the mindset of uh, arun maira and i think that would be a great learning experience for our listeners the first is in your opening statement you used a phrase uh, dama dam leadership which i thought belied a sort of a thinking uh, that you thought that leadership is not supposed to be a pre decided mindset but has to be dynamic and and uh, change with uh, something i thought you said um, experience uh, so can you elaborate that uh, within half a minute so that uh, you know then i move on yes thank you so much you know uh, we uh, look up to leaders uh, to uh, give us a certainty when world is confused we want someone who sounds very sure and someone who then tells very clearly that this should be done we describe those as strong leaders but if the leader herself or himself hasn't understood the whole situation and then just does dhamadam something can cause more harm to the system so we also in the model that we have of leaders encourage those sort of leaders and we in fact in a way are disempowering ourselves because these leaders don't have an understanding of the whole system but we expect them to and if they do not take a firm decision when we want a firm decision we say poor leader okay so we got a great example of donald trump of course i mean man who take a decision with a tweet every morning but it's becoming very messy for the whole world and so people say well we much rather have somebody maybe like joe biden who says look i don't know everything i'm going to get people together and we will together create what we need to create uh, together hmm? so this is a different i say a facilitative model of getting people to learn together then i know i am the authority look up to me whenever you have a problem okay so make adjustments with each day on your uh, leadership patterns is is probably what you are trying to well, the pattern is a consistent one it's a pattern of learning and listening okay, okay. but your yeah, your your what you will do will change because you will discover what needs to be done and also a better way to get it done so constant learning but that is the the constant of good leadership it is a learner like i said a very open learner and learner who is questioning her or his own abilities at all times also in developing them okay and in the interview that you went for which you described um you uh, you know sticking to leadership you said what they were trying to evaluate was uh, does the person have the seeds of leadership in him or her by that are you trying to by by any chance um, uh, you know say that uh, uh, leadership is um, mostly um and in one trait and can be uh, only instilled to a certain extent yeah. no everybody has this seed of wanting to learn a child when a child is born the first instinct of the child is curiosity the child responds to different things and starts touching out and we tell the child don't it's dangerous or starts responding to different sounds and is very curious the instinct of every um living creature whether it's the child of a bird or the child of a lion or the child of a human being is curiosity you know how cubs play puppies play they're very curious they go where they're not supposed to go so this is inbuilt the desire to learn what we do however by education and by parenting also we stop the learning we say don't do that it's dangerous i am telling you i've learned now you stop the learning process the curiosity you're then supposed to take this wisdom and instruction which is what education is and you stop the ability to learn you get information and knowledge but not the ability to learn you kill the ability to learn so it's a seed in us and that's the point is also to shed the other thoughts that are given to you about how to be very smart and a good leader just be more natural <laughs> be curious and be respectful of our others i want to point that out it's a matter of compassion for others great leaders and especially ones that we need at our time must have the quality of compassion for others is gandhi ji's and you described me at the beginning where you think about me as a policy maker and i have learned my deepest lesson of policy from gandhi ji's instructions to all policy makers he said if you have to make a policy think of the poorest person the weakest person that comes to your mind and okay. think of how what effect your policy will have onto that person ananto they are so look around and find the person who is least well off in the present system like my mother would do you know find the, the poorest child the poorest person 
cleaning and sweeping the streets outside and say, what change do we need to make that would enable the improvement of the life and the dignity of that person? So Great. So, essential for leadership. It's not arrogance. Uh, we, we look at the last person in the chain. Great. And I'll tell you, uh, Mr. Mayra, uh, the thing that I learned in the last 25 minutes uh, is from a certain word. I don't know whether you even realize it. There's a particular word that you use the maximum number of time. I, I think you must have used that word at least 30, 40 times uh, over the last 25 minutes. And uh, that is something which will stay not only with me, but each and every listener uh, uh, to this particular session, not once did you use the word intelligence. It was always wisdom. And I think that is something um, which is a take home for me that uh, something which is in scarcity as far as our generation is concerned. Uh, but uh, yes, I move on to the next question. And thank you for that word, wisdom. I, I think whenever I speak now, intelligence is out of my uh, vocabulary and it always will remain uh, wisdom. Um, you very interestingly talked again about that interview where you said not a single question was asked on your core competence. But um, uh, basically uh, what was being tested was your uh, learning ability. Now here I have a very specific question for you, sir. <laughs> like we concentrate so much on learning. So when we learn something new, mm -hmm. what is this process and how difficult is it to unlearn what you already knew and, and uh, which is no longer uh, correct or uh, you need to unlearn? Very um, difficult. And in fact, I take, uh, thank you for picking that up. I didn't realize that I use the word wisdom so, so easily and naturally. You know, we are saying artificial intelligence, and you use the contrast between intelligence and wisdom. Artificial intelligence, AI, is there, and with AI, we can improve the world. I say what we need is natural wisdom. And that's why I say aging improves natural wisdom. Nature runs with a wisdom. We as engineers think that we can control nature, and we think we're intelligent enough to control nature. In fact, we are so intelligent, we can design machines and computers, which will have intelligence, which will then somehow overcome nature. And this is where we're finding like with climate change. All our man-made machines and ideas have overused and destroyed the system of which we are a part and the machines naturally. If we don't exist, then are the machines going to populate themselves? Yes, they will populate themselves with just intelligence, artificial intelligence. But the wisdom that nature has of enabling complex systems, many species, many species to coexist and co-evolve together is lost, is lost. Okay. So this is the biggest difficulty that we're having today, that the engineering mindset, the management, get it done, be focused mindset has to be unlearned. Okay. Absorb the wisdom of older people, absorb the wisdom of life, absorb the wisdom of nature. Uh, since we are running out of time, one quick question, I think, uh, which is extremely, I feel crucial and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, uh, I'm alive to the fact that we are running out of time. Um, now on the matter of listening, uh, I think you spent a lot of time and effort on listening to people who do not think like you. You've written a book, which is very interesting, which is listening for well-being and your tagline there is extremely interesting. And I, I suggest everybody reads that book, which is conversations with people not like us. So now, what are you trying to say? Are you trying to say that if somebody thinks like me, that person is reinforcing a thought process of mine, which not might not necessarily be the correct or the right thought process and should we avoid I'm, it? I'm learning nothing new from people who think like me. I'm certainly not learning how to think differently from people who think like me. So I want to change the way I think, which is what we're just talking about. We've got to fundamentally change the way we think about our position in the world and about the wisdom in others, then I must go to people who I'm fearful of talking to because they don't like me and I fear I'll get into a big argument with them. But I must pause and humbly listen, not to what they are saying, but to ask why they believe that. Why do they think like that? And in that, I'll discover wisdom that they have discovered in human beings. I'll discover who they are. 
So, okay, great. I think another take home that I have uh, you know, for myself and all our listeners is next time be on a lookout for a person who does not think like you rather than avoiding such a person and, and try to absorb from that person what you can. Uh, so uh, absolutely great, Mr. Arun Myra. And, and I'll tell you one thing about learning is um, through the things that you said, uh, I would say, uh, I would look to learn, you know, taking inspiration from all that you said, learning as an individual, maybe uh, differently as an entrepreneur, and maybe differently as an enterprise that I'm running. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Arun Mahira, uh, I think it was absolutely fantastic and wonderful uh, listening to you. I, I just wish this session would go on and on and on and, and we could hear more from you, but maybe next year. So thank you so yes, very so much. And thank, you. thank you. Remember next year, we are going to listen to your shares, okay? At the <laughs> Orange City Festival. Thank you thank so much. You, thank you so very much and back to you, Neha. Thanks a ton to both of you. And on behalf of OCLF, I sincerely express my gratitude towards your acceptance for this session and knowledge shared with us. And lastly, special thanks to the SGR Knowledge Foundation. And now you can join the next session. Thank you. Twenty years of existence. Two universities. 23 educational institutes offering 137 courses. Rysoni Group of Institutions, a vision beyond.